Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Union League Club. My name is John Adams. I'm an attorney at the Chicago-based litigation boutique Imer Stahl, and I'm also president of the Chicago Lawyers Chapter for the Federalist Society. It's rare for law professors to grab headlines for their academic work. And it's even more unusual for them to do so when their scholarship has yet to be finalized. Today, however, we're privileged to hear from two scholars whose force of intellect have moved immediately from the pages of law journals to the columns of major media outlets and the opinions of jurists nationwide. The pressing legal issue that they're facing is their scholarship analyzing whether Section 3 of the 14th Amendment the so-called Insurrection Clause bars President Trump from holding office. In August 2023, Professor Bode, the Harry Calvin Jr. Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, co-authored an article called The Sweep and Force of Section 3 for the University of Pennsylvania Law Review. Although his paper remains forthcoming, and as I understand it will be published uh, next month or maybe shortly thereafter, it has received more than 105,000 downloads from SSRN and more than 305,000 views of his abstract. Mere days after its posting, Politico boosted the article, headlining that legal scholars say the 14th Amendment bars Trump from office. The New York Times further elevated his research with Supreme Court correspondent Adam Liptak writing, two prominent conservative law professors, Professor William Bode and Michael Stokes Paulson, have concluded that Donald J. Trump is ineligible to be president under the provision of the Constitution that bars people who have engaged in an insurrection from holding government office. His column from last summer went on to write that a law review article will not, of course, change the reality that Mr. Trump is the Republican front runner and that voters remain free to assess whether his conduct was blameworthy. But the scope and depth of the article may encourage and undergird lawsuits arguing that the Constitution makes him ineligible for office. That was a pretty good prediction. Over the last few months, more than 60 lawsuits or administrative challenges have been filed across the nation seeking to keep President Trump from appearing on the presidential primary or general election ballot under legal theories proffered by Professor Bode. Courts considering these claims, including courts in Michigan and in Minnesota, have mostly rejected the challenges for various reasons. But just a few weeks ago, the Colorado Supreme Court held that President Trump is disqualified from holding office because he engaged in an insurrection. The Secretary of State of Maine followed this decision more recently to conclude the same. Unsurprisingly, the Colorado justices in the majority cited Professor Bode eight times throughout their per curiam opinion. The justices also cited Professor Josh Blackbitt, but only seven times. Uh, two more times, Professor, you may have been in the majority. One month after Professor Bode posted in SSRN his forthcoming article, The Sweep and Force of Section 3, Professor Blackman rejoined with his own forthcoming article, sweeping and forcing the president into Section 3. It's a pretty good title for a rejoinder. To date, Professor Blackman's month-old article has also received thousands of downloads and dozens of citations in courts and journals nationwide. Professor Blackman and his scholarship on the Insurrection Clause, likewise, have been chronicled and featured in major media outlets ranging from the Washington Post to the New York Times. The Supreme Court recently decided to hear Trump against Anderson to determine whether the Colorado Supreme Court erred in ordering former President Trump excluded from the 2024 presidential primary ballot. Predictably, Professor Bode and Professor Blackman made numerous appearances in the papers before the court, and indeed, Professor Blackman submitted an amicus brief uh, in support of reversing Anderson. Although the outcome of Anderson is uncertain, what we can say with certainty is that Professor Bode and Professor Blackman will continue to make an outsized influence on this important and pressing legal question 
that could affect tens of millions of voters in the 2024 presidential race. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming these two esteemed scholars. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming out to, to hear us talk today. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, I'm not involved in any of these lawsuits. Uh, I haven't filed any briefs in them. I'm not involved in any way. Uh, <clears throat> that said, I do think the core point raised in a lot of these lawsuits about the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and its applications to recent events are correct uh, for reasons that I've written in a 126-page article that I hope nobody tries to read the entirety of. Um, but that we'll try to try to talk through a bit today. So what is the subject under discussion? It's section three of the 14th Amendment, which is a little bit wordy, so I'm going to read it once. It's up on the board behind me. You can't really read it there, but I'll read it once, and you'll have to bear with me. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state, who having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in an insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. So uh, in my opening statement here, I want to make four points about this clause. Uh, all of which explain why the Colorado Supreme Court was right to conclude that former President Donald Trump cannot become president again. Point one, Section 3 uh, was enacted to deal with the Civil War, but it applies beyond the Civil War. The immediate purpose of this clause, maybe obvious, uh, was immediately after the Civil War to respond to the reality that many of the people who would naturally become uh, in charge in the Confederate States and potentially rise to national government were people who had just rebelled against that government uh, after holding high office in the government. Folks like Jefferson Davis, Alexander Stevens, and Robert E. Lee, and many others. Section 3 is enacted as part of the many clauses in the 14th Amendment that you probably know more about, that we think more about, to say that there was a limit to that, that people who had previously taken an oath, subsequently engaged in insurrect insurrection or rebellion, could not come back to government, at least unless Congress granted amnesty first. Um, but it's written in general terms. In fact, an earlier draft of a version of Section 3 specifically limited, uh, specifically applied only to the Civil War. It, it called it the late insurrection. So there's an earlier draft that referred only to the late insurrection. Uh, and it was made clear that it expired in 1870. So an earlier draft would have said, you know, people who, you good? We're good. All right. People who had engaged in the, civil, in the Civil War specifically can't vote in federal elections until 1870, but then it would expire. This was criticized on the grounds that the Constitution shouldn't contain kind of temporary one-time rules that would seem like a, a mere partisan politics. It should contain only long-standing durable principles. And so Section 3 instead contains a long-standing durable principle. The authors of Section 3 did not know what future insurrections or rebellions we would have. They knew we'd had some in the past, and they enacted a clause that says for each insurrection or rebellion that occurs in the future, uh, people who have taken an oath and then engaged in that can't take new oaths, having proven themselves untrustworthy, until and unless Congress grants an amnesty. And after the Civil War, Congress did eventually grant amnesty to most and then all of the folks who had engaged in uh, the Civil War uh, over the course of the 19th century, sort of eventually putting that, putting that uh, to bed, but leaving open the course of history for the 20th and 21st century. All right, point two. <clears throat> Section 3, this provision is self-executing in the sense that it is a constitutional provision that's already enforceable and ready for use. It requires no criminal conviction. You don't have to be convicted of insurrection or rebellion. It requires no action from Congress. Congress doesn't have to, have to activate Section 3 for it to work. It's just in the Constitution already activated. This is evident from Section 3's text, which parallels other qualifications for office in the Constitution. Section 3 begins, no person shall be, just as Article 1, Section 2 says, no person shall be a representative who doesn't meet the requirements of age, residency, and citizenship. Article 1, Section 3, no person shall be a senator, et cetera, et cetera. Article 2, Section 1, no person except a natural-born citizen or a citizen of the United States uh, shall be eligible to the office of president. 
Section 3 parallels the same qualifications for office elsewhere in the Constitution and just establishes one new qualification for office. You have to be a citizen, a resident, uh, a citizen for a certain number of years, and also not have engaged in insurrection against the United States after holding previous office. In the same way that those pre other qualifications don't require you to be convicted of being a non-citizen, that's not even a crime, um, convicted of not having been a resident, uh, Section 3 requires, requires nothing more. This is also clear from the structure of Section 3, which after all does give Congress a role, but that role is to remove the disability imposed by Section 3. It's not that Congress has to first act to sweep people into Section 3 and then can unact. It's quite clear that Section 3 starts with, here are the people who are covered and here's the conduct they're covered for, and then Congress can recognize that in some cases this will sweep too broadly, or in some cases it will be too destructive for the country to say that some popular person can't hold office, Congress then has the ability, uh, maybe even the responsibility, by a two-thirds of each house to remove that disability. And this is also clear from history. This is how Section 3 worked when it was enacted. Uh, it was immediately treated as, treated as enforceable, treated as law in states by executive agents across the country. That's part of why Congress felt such pressure to act eventually and, and grant amnesty to many people, the sense that Section 3 was uh, a rule that was enforceable, ready for use, unless Congress acted to, to grant amnesty. <clears throat> there is one uh, important piece of evidence to the contrary, which I'm sure we will talk about in the course of this debate, which is a circuit court opinion called Griffin's Case, issued by a man named Chief Justice Chase, uh, who was acting as a lower court judge riding circuit in a habeas case involving a man named Caesar Griffin. In this case, <clears throat> Chief Justice Chase concludes that even though Mr. Griffin has been convicted by a judge who is potentially disqualified under Section 3, a judge who had been a judge beforehand, then been part of the uh, secessionist government during the Civil War, now is trying to become a judge again. Chief Justice Chase concluded that that wasn't a valid basis for habeas relief, that because nobody had acted, uh, you couldn't get out of jail just because your judge had maybe, maybe should have been disqualified under Section 3. In the course of this opinion, Chief Justice Chase says a lot of things. Um, some of them, I think, are, are quite right. Uh, so he says that there's an important doctrine in the law called the de facto officer doctrine, which says that even if maybe you shouldn't have been allowed to hold office, if you were, if you were acting as an officer de facto because nobody questioned that, sometimes your actions still have validity. People here who lit litigate regulatory and administrative law challenges probably confront these doctrines all the time, where somebody will later come up and say, wait a minute, this administrative law judge was not appointed in accordance with some important pre precedent of the appointments clause, and there will be a complicated dispute about whether that matters and which decisions the administrative law judge reached could be overturned and which ones can't. <laughs> Part of Griffin's case involves that doctrine, uh, which is very interesting, and I'm happy to talk about it, but it's not particularly relevant. In the course of the opinion, Chief Justice Chase also makes broader claims. Uh, Chief Justice Chase does also say, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does nothing until Congress acts to enforce it. He says it's not self-executing. It's sort of uh, dormant until, until Congress acts to enforce it because the consequences of enforcing it would be so broad. The consequences of enforcing it would potentially sweep so many uh, Confederates out of office, and that, and that can't be what's called for. Um, as I've implied, and as I'm happy to talk about more, I think that's just not the way the Constitution is written, not the way the Constitution was understood to work. Uh, Section 3 is a qualification for office, and Congress does have an important role to play, which is deciding whether to lift it and whether to grant amnesty. Uh, Chief Justice Chase, for many reasons, didn't want to read the clause the way it's actually written, and so he denied this, but I think it's probably not too late for us to recognize that, that not everything that a Chief Justice of the United States says is always correct, and sometimes it's our job to recognize their errors and not to, and not to repeat them. All right, so point one, section three applies beyond the Civil War. Point two, section three is self-executing and, and ready for use. <clears throat> Brings us to point three. <clears throat> The events of January 6, 2021, were an insurrection within the meaning of the Constitution. Noah Webster's 1864 Dictionary, one of the most important dictionaries of the English language, defines an insurrection as a rising against civil or political authority, the open and active opposition of a number of persons to the execution of law in a city or state, a rebellion, a revolt. Uh, in this article, we canvass dictionary definitions, parallel interpretations of the Constitution, usages of the term insurrection or rebellion by President Lincoln, the Civil War Congress, the Supreme Court during the prize cases, the enforcement of Congress's power to 
call it the militia to suppress insurrections, which happened extensively in the 19th century, uh, and a lot of other sources to try to figure out what is the meaning of an insurrection in the Constitution. And our conclusion, roughly tracking uh, Webster's definition, maybe slightly more limited, is that an insurrection is concerted forcible resistance to the authority of government to execute the laws in at least some significant respect. That, of course, includes the biggest insurrection of all, the Civil War, but it's not just the Civil War. Uh, the Whiskey Rebellion, which at the time was called the Whiskey Insurrection, Fry's Rebellion, the Door Rebellion, there were a whole series of important and much smaller insurrections throughout the 19th century that were recognized as insurrections. Often when a group of 100 or 1,000 extremely disgruntled people thought some government measure was unjust and corrupt and banded together to try to, to forcibly stop it because they thought the government was acting illegitimately or without authority. And that, I think, closely tracks what we know about the events of January 6th, at least so far as many of the participants were concerned, perhaps not all. Uh, people were there for different reasons, had different purposes, but a central purpose of many of the people who were there was to resist the authority of government, Congress and the Vice President, to count the electoral votes in the manner that they thought was appropriate and in the manner that many other people thought was fraudulent and wrong. This is what a trial court in Colorado concluded in the course of adjudicating whether Donald Trump can be on the presidential ballot in Colorado. It held a five-day bench trial and concluded after the presentation of much evidence that the events of January 6, 2021 were an insurrection. Leaves me with point four. Uh, former President Donald Trump engaged in that insurrection. Uh, constitutional <laughs> phrases have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. This is, I think, the closest and most complicated question. Of course, President Donald Trump did not himself uh, march into the Capitol uh, on January 6th. He stayed at the Ellipse, having <clears throat> spoken to uh, and, and riled up the crowd, and then he stayed in the White House. Uh, watching events unfold without personally entering or participating. But in 1867, when Section 3 was being enforced, first being enforced against the states, Attorney General Henry Stanberry wrote uh, that when a person has, by speech or by writing, incited others to engage in rebellion, he must come under the disqual disqualification as well. That this is consistent with the well-understood, well-settled meaning of the clause, that those who incite insurrection and rebellion are also those who have engaged in insurrection or rebellion. This is a long-standing principle of criminal law as well. And the conclusion of the trial court, again, in the Colorado case, after hearing evidence from both sides, was that, that is exactly what happened, that Donald Trump incited the crowd to go to Congress and unlawfully resist the counting electoral votes. That is the message he intended, that is the message they received, and that is the message they acted upon. Additionally, uh, Donald Trump had a responsibility as president at the time to take, care, to take care of the laws were faithfully executed, which means he had an obligation once the insurrection was in progress to stop it. Um, and the evidence also showed that he acted very slowly on that obligation, in part, concluded the courts, because he supported the aims of the insurrection rather than resisting them. Now, I should be clear, uh, uh, Donald Trump had the opportunity to, but chose not to you know, personally appear at this trial and present testimony. Perhaps if he had appeared and credibly testified that this is not what he wanted to happen at all, the crowd totally misunderstood him and he was appalled at what had happened and acted as quickly as he could to, to stop it, perhaps if he testified that and it was credible and people believed that, that would change the way we think about this issue. But you know, courts are supposed to adjudicate law on the records that they have in front of the procedures they have. And on the record we have in front of the Colorado courts, Donald Trump engaged in the insurrection of January 6, 2021 and that makes him disqualified to hold office under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. As a matter of Colorado law, anybody who is disqualified to hold office is not supposed to be on the presidential ballot, so they don't run the risk of uh, voters throwing their votes away and you know, voting, millions of people voting for somebody who's disqualified. So the Colorado courts concluded as a matter of state election law that because Donald Trump is disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, they didn't want to put him on the ballot. Under Article 2 of the Constitution, states decide how to select electors and who should be on the ballot, and their conclusion seems to be entirely right. So the Supreme Court will next month review all the questions we just talked about and arguments Josh will raise to you in a minute, but it seems to me that on the evidence we have and on the Constitution we have, they should affirm the Colorado Supreme Court, because Donald Trump is disqualified to become president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Thank you.
thank you. A federal society is at its best when you have people debate each other who often agree. And we can debate respectfully. So I thank Will for uh, agreeing to debate me today. Uh, it's cold outside, but we'll bring the heat. Um, there, are, there are four questions here. Will had his four, I have my four. And these are the four Trump questions. First, can the Colorado Supreme Court disqualify Trump using his election laws? Second, did Trump's presidential oath subject him to Section 3? Will didn't mention this one, but we will talk about it shortly. Third, did Trump engage in insurrection? We'll talk about that one. Fourth, is Trump disqualified from holding the presidency? We'll didn't talk about that one, okay? Those are the four Trump questions, but there are four legal questions I want to bring up. The first one is, does Section 3 require federal enforcement legislation? Here, Will and I disagree. Uh, I think Chief Justice Chase got it right, and you do need legislation when seeking affirmative relief under the 14th Amendment, whether Section 1 or Section 3. The second issue is very important. Section 3 would only apply to Trump if the presidential oath he took was as an officer of the United States. That's the key phrase, officer of the United States. And our position is that he's not. The third one, were the events of January 6th an insurrection? Seth and I actually don't take a position on that one. In our view, though, he didn't engage in whatever happened on the 6th. And the last one, is the presidency in office under the United States? In other words, Section 3 lists a host of positions that you can't hold if you're disqualified. Is the presidency in such a position? Again, Seth and I have not taken a position on this issue. So really, one and two is what my presentation will focus on today. In order for Will's position to prevail, he has to run the table. He has to write about everything he just said. If he's even wrong about one of those things, Trump cannot be disqualified. So if we're right on issue one or issue two, Trump's on the ballot, he can become president. So the starting point actually is my colleague Seth Barrett Tillman. If you haven't heard of him, you should have. He's one of the most underrated scholars perhaps in the world. Uh, he's a law professor in Ireland, and since 2008, he has argued, often alone, <laughs> that the president is not an office for the United States, and he's not an office under the United States. He's made the position long before Trump came on the map, and his position based on the text of the Constitution. The Appointments Clause said the president appoints the office of the United States. The Impeachment Clause separates the president from the office of the United States. The Commissions Clause said the president shall commission the office of the United States. All these provisions seem to suggest the president's not an office of the United States. And we have Supreme Court cases going back to John Marshall to the 1800s saying, office of the United States means appointed, not elected. So there's a lot of authority backing Seth's position. Now, I came on the scene in 2013. I was Tillmanized. I actually came across Seth's work, and I became persuaded by it. I said, hey, Seth, I have some questions. And we started going back and forth. And that created what's been a very fruitful relationship. But don't take my word. Take Will's word. Uh, in 2016, Will wrote a very generous review of Seth's work in a journal called Jotwell, which is a journal of things we like lots. Um, and I actually was like unsure about Seth, but I wrote, I wrote Will. Will said, look, Tillman's theory makes sense of patterns that most of us never saw, but it's ordered of chaos. He has single-handedly shifted the burden of proof. And I actually was taken by Will's writing. I was like, wow, if Will thinks this, then maybe Tillman's onto something. So in 2017, I approached Seth. I said, look, Seth, we have this thing called the Emoluments Clause, right? You've written for years the President's not subject to it. All of a sudden, there's litigation that Trump and his hotels are accepting foreign emoluments from foreign governments. We need to stop him. So he said, Seth, do you want to write an amicus brief on this? And it was not really well deeply thought out. We didn't know what we were getting into. So yeah, sure. So over the course of four years, we argued that the President does not hold an office under the United States. Only one or maybe two courts reached the merits, disagreed with us talk about that later if you want, we put together a framework. We said, look, there's different language in the Constitution. Officers of the United States, office of the United States, all that refers to appointed positions. <clears throat> now, the emoluments clause litigation ran to a halt. Why? Trump lost the election. So the Supreme Court never decided the issue. So let's go to 2020. Okay, we thought we were done with this office officer stuff. All right, we, we've done enough work on this, right? Who cares? Uh, but then the ellipse came. Then the speech came. And that day, Seth and I realized, oh crap, we're gonna have to do insurrection now. Why? Because section three has the exact same language the Constitution uses. Officer of the United States, office under the United States. The same issue that we've been writing about for years was like, okay, here we go again. If you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, my life is basically Groundhog Day. Every day it's like, is the president officer of the United States? It's the same issue. So we probably wrote an article in 2021 uh, for the New York NYU Journal of Law and Liberty said, is the president an office of the United States? And we answered the question, no. 
But we knew this was not going to be the final say on it. We knew that someone was going to come out and disagree with us. We didn't know <coughs> is there'd be our good friend Will Bode, who I've counted as a friend for many years now. And Will and Michael came out with this article in August. And in fairness, they sent us a draft copy. They did not have to do that. That was very gracious, which allowed us to write a, <laughs> their paper was 125 pages. We had about 250 pages. So <laughs> not, not, not weighing stuff, but we have more pounds, I think. Uh, <laughs> But Will and Michael wrote this important article that's probably the most important unpublished paper in modern American history. Maybe I'm slightly exaggerating, but they gave the impetus to all these lawsuits nationwide. They said, look, if these two stalwart FedSoc members can come to this conclusion as originalists, this has to be right. I don't know if Will, had, if Will and Michael had not written this paper, maybe they did something like conflicts of law and said something a little bit more arcane, would the Colorado court have done what it did? I don't know, I think Will bent the arc of history. I don't know what will happen at the Supreme Court, but it's, it's, they, they change history. For better or worse, I'll let, you, I'll let the court of history decide that one, but they change history. And they said with confidence that virtually every piece of evidence supports the disqualification of Donald Trump. Now, Will gave you his spiel, which is, uh, uh, I think, a very coherent thing in 15 minutes, but he alighted over the office issue. And indeed, in this paper for 100 and odd pages, only a couple pages talked about the office issue. And I want to just jump to one quote in particular. Uh, uh, Paulson and Bode wrote that Blackman and Tillman, that's us, that our approach is hidden meaning hermeneutics. They render Section 3 a secret code loaded with this, uh, hidden meanings discernible only by a, sleek, a slight priesthood of the Illuminati. So you are now all going to be inducted into our cult. Welcome. I will give you a secret decoder ring. Maybe you were listening to oral argument this morning. Roman Martinez made that line. And just out of curiosity, I actually asked chat GPT if they would make a graphic of a secret code hidden by a select priesthood Illuminati. And they said, we do not promote conspiracy. So chat GPT wouldn't even give us what he wanted, but we will give it to you. Will's mentor, Akil Mar, was even more forceful. He said, this argument's stupid, genuinely stupid. This camera does not need to record it. Genuinely stupid, it's embarrassing, it's wrong, so on and so on, okay? So after all these sort of, sort of hyperboles came out that the positions that have, I have is just stupid and embarrassing, uh, something crazy happened. The Colorado trial court, which we'll mention, adopted our argument. Of course, the Trump lawyers did. They've used our stuff for, for months. That's not to be surprising. But the Colorado trial court, an elected Democrat, agreed with us. And our argument was based on text. So I know you can't read this, but I'll just sort of describe it to you. She looked at four provisions. The appointments clause, the impeachment clause, the commissions clause, and the oath or affirmation clause of the Constitution. Okay, why are those relevant? The appointments clause says, an officer of the United States can be appointed by the president, the courts of law, or the heads of department. That is it. And the Supreme Court said, if you don't go through that process, you are not an officer of the United States. It's pretty clear. The president does not go through that process. The impeachment clause lays out who can be impeached. The president, the vice president, and civil officers of the United States. These are different categories. The framers seem to separate the president and the vice president. By the way, the president and the VP, they are civil officials. They're not military. I can give you precedent and precedent saying that. The commissions clause. The president shall commission all the officers of the United States. The oath clause. The officers of the United States take an oath. The president fits into none of those provisions. And really, it's, it's a process. Marbury, right? First you're appointed. Then you get commissioned, right? And if you're bad, you get impeached. All those apply to appointed positions, which are spelled out separately. The president does not fit into any of those categories. So again, the trial court is not an Illuminati priest. This is not some sort of a cultish figure. She simply said, looking at the text, it seems the framers would have understood that the president was not an officer of the United States. And if you don't believe us, we have mounds of Supreme Court precedent. A case called U.S. versus Smith from 1888 by Justice Field, a Lincoln appointee. Yeah, he was appointed by Lincoln. Said, quote, an officer of the United States can only be appointed by the president by and with the advice and consent of the Senate or by a court of law or head of department. A person who does not derive his position from such an appointment is not an officer of the United States in the sense of the Constitution. That's right there in black and white. This is not a secret code. It's right there. But what makes it so uncomfortable, like how could the framers have anticipated? Why would they have excluded the president? I'll get there. Now we have the Colorado Supreme Court. The Colorado Supreme Court, again, relying on Will and Bode, said, wait a minute, this is, this is silly, right? We're splitting hairs here. 
officer of the United States, office of the United States, potato, potato, who cares, right? In the colloquial, general sense, the president's an officer, that's good enough for us. The Colorado Supreme Court did not cite the appointments clause, did not cite the commissions clause, did not cite the impeachment clause, cited none of the evidence we put forward. Yes, seven, seven citations, eight would have done it. If they'd even cited our brief, or even looked at it, it would have been a harder call to make. All right? But we don't care about Colorado courts anymore. We are now upstairs at the US Supreme Court. About two weeks ago, the court granted certiorari in Trump against Anderson. They put a super accelerated briefing schedule, not super fast, but super, but pretty fast, and arguments we held in DC on the 8th. Uh, Seth Tillman and I put an amic amicus brief on a few uh, weeks ago. We were actually the first to file, and now everyone's kind of coming after us. And uh, you know, that's how it works, we're ready to roll. And we made a point that I think might resonate. And this gets to the point of why would the framers omit the president? Now, Donald Trump is unique in many ways, in more ways than one. But in one way in particular, he never held prior office. Every other president was either a general, or a governor, or a member of Congress, or a senator, or a mayor, or something, right? She's not mayor. It held some position, right? Some other prior position. Trump never did. The framers were not omniscient. They would not have thought about a person who, ready, was elected president, never took another oath, engaged in insurrection, and then ran for re-election. That is a series of facts that just they've had no reason to think about. And then we're all textualists. We're all textualists, right, Justice Kagan? She said we're not all originalists. Maybe we are. I don't know. But we have this case called Bostock, which I am not a fan of the case. But Bostock said, what matters? The unexpressed intentions or the words chosen? And Gorsuch and all the course progressives said, what matters is the written word. What matters is the written word, not the unexpressed intentions. And in 1868, the president was not an officer of the United States. Now, I, I don't like podcasts. Will knows this, but I do listen to this from time to time. And on a re recent podcast, Will said, uh, don't underestimate Tillman. Uh, I agree with this. And he made a point that's actually kind of curious. He said, our argument is the perfect argument. And he used the word hilariously beautiful. Why? If the court agrees with us that Trump's not an officer of the United States, he's on the ballot. But nothing else happens. This would be ruling limited to one human being ever, Donald Trump. You don't have to decide, was it an insurrection? Did Trump engage in it? Is the presidency covered? Execution? Our argument is a clean out for the court. Now, maybe the court wants to go the full nine yards and take Will's approach and knock Trump off the ballot. I, I mean, look, maybe it'll happen. I, I, I am skeptical. But if the court wants an out, it can do what we say. And this is sort of the conclusion of our brief, right? If the court holds, as Chief Justice Chase said, that Section 3 is not self-executing, look, the litigation in Colorado comes to a halt. But don't forget about January 6th of 2025, when they count the votes. Would an electoral vote given for Donald Trump be, quote, regularly given? In other words, could a Democratic-controlled Congress disqualify Trump on January 6th. The same thing that John Eastman wanted to happen last time, could the Democrats do this time? So instead of having to, John Eastman, right? Will has not made this point, but I'm sure someone else will come up and make it. Can the Congress on January 6th knock Trump out? And by the way, can you appeal from a joint session of Congress to the Supreme Court? I don't know. And if Trump takes the oath, or if Biden takes the oath, or if Joe Manchin takes the oath, there'll be litigation, you know, who's the real pope? Who's the real president? If this issue lingers for a day beyond February of 2024, we are stuck with deciding who the real president is. So I think the court will want to take our approach. A holding that the president's not offered the United States, that settles the issue, unless Congress decides to ignore the court, which <laughs> then, we're, then, we're in, then, we're, then we're in uncharted territory for sure. So look, that's where we are. Donald Trump makes obscure con law great again, and it keeps my life living Groundhog Day. Thank you so much. Uh, I can leave, I'll put the text back up for Will. Thank you all so much, and I welcome the chance to discuss with you. All right, let me take a few minutes uh, in response. Um, you know, the past few years, people often ask me, uh, isn't it exciting to be a constitutional law professor with all the you know, constitutional crises we have going on? 
And I, I guess I'm supposed to say yes. I, I will say, I usually say, I don't know, do firefighters get excited when houses burn down? Um, maybe they do, actually, I don't know. But, uh, but <clears throat> you know, I, I'd be perfectly happy not to have these issues be relevant and not to have the 100,000 downloads. Uh, but, but here we are. All right, so the bulk of Josh's response just now uh, was about this issue of, is the president covered by Section 3 in various respects? Does he take an oath to support the Constitution as an officer of the United States? <laughs> okay. is, is he an office, does he then hold office under the United States? And if the answer to those questions are no, then you know, all of this is beside the point. It might matter for other folks who engaged in the January 6th insurrection. It might matter for um, if they attempt to hold office again, uh, but it won't matter for, for the presidential election that they all care about. But with respect, I, I do think the argument that the president is not an officer of the United States for purposes of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is not very strong. Um, so I think the, we could start with uh, an article Josh once wrote uh, complaining about justices and academics who conduct what he calls originalism at the wrong time. And the mistake of originalism at the wrong time is looking at the 14th Amendment, which was written in 1866 and ratified in 1867 and 1868, as if it were from 1789, as if it were part of the original Constitution 80 years earlier, even though many things had changed, many terms had come to have different or more complicated or more ambiguous meanings, and even though you know, a lot of realities about our country had changed by then. So when we're interpreting the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, we need to know what its meaning was in the 1860s, not in the 1780s. That, I think, makes it a mistake to try to index or decode the meaning of the 14th Amendment by just reading all the provisions against things that were enacted in the original Constitution 80 years earlier. Now, that could be useful. Sometimes when a later amendment uses terms that were an earlier amendment, that's on purpose. And sometimes that's because they want them to have the same meanings, but not always. Sometimes they know that the phrase is in the Constitution earlier and use it again without fully investigating the original meaning of the terms that they are copying. Or sometimes they use the terms you know, for other reasons. So it's a mistake to assume that every time different phrases appear in the Constitution, they always have exactly the same meaning, unless we, unless we know that's what the authors were, were trying to do. And that's especially true here. So nobody doubts, I don't think anybody denies, that the President of the United States is an officer, in the sense that he holds an office, what the Constitution calls the office of President. The Constitution over and over again refers him to holding the office of President. He's an officer in that sense. So the question, the argument is not about whether he's an officer, it's about the parsing of prepositional phrases. The question is, is he an officer of the United States or under the United States? Uh, and those terms, I suggest, don't have as plain of a textual meaning. You need a legal genius like Seth Barrett Tillman or Josh Blackman to find the meaning of those things and tell it to you before you discover it. Uh, and I don't think that looking at that gives us a lot of reason to doubt the president, the president is covered. Almost all, if you do look at the other provisions of the Constitution, Many of them are also ambiguous about the president. So the impeachment clause says that the president, the vice president, and all civil officers of the United States can be impeached. Aha, perhaps this implies that the president and the vice president are not civil officers of the United States because they're you know, listed separately. But perhaps they're listed separately because in addition to being civil officers, they're also military officers. The president is the commander in chief, the vice president is next in line to become the commander in chief. And indeed, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment refers to any office, any office, civil or military, perhaps to clarify that same kind of thing. Or if you look at the Appointments Clause, there's a reference in the Appointments Clause to officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for. Many pages have been spilled on who are these officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for. But one possibility is that's the President and Vice President whose appointment is otherwise provided for in Article 2, which lays out how they become officers of the United States. There are other theories. Maybe the phrase doesn't mean anything. Maybe there isn't anybody in that category. It's like a weird empty set included in the Constitution, as some people have written. But, but again, if you do start trying to parse all of the provisions of the original Constitution, you don't get anything like a clear statement that the president is not an officer of the United States. And if you look at the various cases that say these things about how to be an officer of the United States, you must have been appointed, they're just talking about the Appointments Clause. They're restating other clauses in the Constitution that you know, are not the clause under discussion. None of them say that the president is not an officer of the United States for purposes of Section 3, because I don't think this question occurred to anybody for the reasons Josh suggested until a couple of years ago. Uh, I think the evidence that somehow that, that, that the president's not covered is very weak. 
Additionally, <coughs> the other phrase in the 14th Amendment about an office under the United States, and again, I apologize for focusing on the prepositional phrases, but I think that's the argument. There is abundant evidence that the president was considered an office under the United States. This came up during the drafting of the 14th Amendment. Reverdy Johnson looked at the 14th Amendment and said, wait a minute, the presidency's not covered. And then Senator Morrill said, no, he is covered, the presidency is covered, because that's an office under the United States. And Reverdy Johnson said, oh, okay, I accept that. I didn't see it at first, because it's not spelled out explicitly, but I accept that. There are dozens, maybe hundreds, of newspaper articles after Section 3 is enacted about the question of whether Jefferson Davis can become president of the United States, which is an argument about uh, assuming that the clause covers the president of the United States. So it would be very strange if the phrase office under the United States in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment included the president, and somehow officer of the United States did not, uh, and the question just escaped everybody's notice because it never came up until now. I suggest that that's not the most natural way to read the text of the Constitution uh, or to understand its original meaning, and that the better argument is the president takes an oath as an officer, and indeed an officer of the United States. And you don't need to look much older or further back uh, to see whether that's true. Um, I think Josh is also going to want to complain about enforcement legislation, but I'll leave it to him to decide whether that's uh, what he wants to raise. Thanks. Thanks. So I anticipated Will's response, so I can slide together also. Uh, you know, that's how it goes. Um, there's, a, there's an old canon of construction that says when you have a text that uses a phrase in an earlier text, it brings with it the old soil, as Felix Frankfurt articulated it. And, and I get Will, it's like, you know, original at the right time. But we have a 14th Amendment that was not drafted on a blank slate. The Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendment have almost identical language. The 13th Amendment is based on the Northwest Ordinance, very similar language. Your privileges or, like prepositions, the privileges or immunities clause is very similar to the privileges and immunities clause. We looked at Bushrod Washington. So the framers were not drafting on a blank slate. And I think you have to understand where these provisions came from. So what does Article 6 do, right? Article 6 provides an oath and it says the senators, representatives, blah, 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 Offers of the United States shall take an oath to the Constitution. And then you look at Section 3, right? Section 3 is very similar. It said, here are all the people that have taken an oath to the Constitution. All right, I'll put them side by side. Article 6 says, all the people take an oath to the Constitution. And Section 3 said, these people took an oath to the Constitution or subject to disqualification. We don't know why the framers chose the words they did but they chose words that are very similar to the Constitution of 1788, very similar words. I think it would be a mistake to say that they just draft this out of whole cloth. Instead, they use the words. And when you use the words in Article 6, you bring with it that meaning. And there were scholars and jurists who said the positions referenced in Article 6 are the same positions referenced in Section 3. These are the, the exact same positions. A guy named George Washington Pascal, who was a Southern Unionist, very important guy at the time, said that Article 6 applies to the same class of officers. So we're doing originals at the right time. The meaning carried over from 1788 to 1868. And once I understand that the question is, was the president officer of the United States in 18, I'm sorry, in, 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 in 1788? So let's look to the text again, okay? Article 6 says you take an oath to the Constitution as an officer of the United States. The president has never taken an Article VI oath. We know that there's a statute, there's words in it. Washington never took those oaths. In fact, George Washington, of blessed memory, right? He took an oath to the Constitution before Congress had even assembled. The president does not take an oath subject to Congress's control because he needs to take it before Congress can even assemble in the first Congress. There is very good argument the president's not an officer of the United States. Will says maybe the president's military. Joseph Story, Alexander Hamilton Nunn said the president's civilian. The vice president has no duty, as John Adams said, he's a worthless position, he's not military at all. The argument doesn't hold much water. So while George Washington took his oath as an officer of the United States, what about John Adams? This is not well known. Adams only took his oath as a legislative officer. He took an oath as a president of the Senate. To this day, the oath that the VP takes is as a legislative officer, not as an officer of the United States, because he's not appointed, all right? Um, I agree with Will in part. There's a lot of evidence showing that the presidency is an office under the United States. 
There's evidence about this, right? There's lots of people at the time who said, oh, Jefferson Davis this, can't be president. So we've actually not taken a position. In fact, we've said that it's possible from 1788 to 1868 that maybe there was a drift in meaning, that maybe the name of office under the United States drifted, but did not drift for office for the United States. We have court cases throughout the 19th century saying office for the United States means appointed. Right? And again, I'll go back to this case, United States against Smith, which is a case that is very relevant. And it says the way to become an officer of the United States is to be appointed by the president. That's what it takes. All right. In terms of, I'll turn now to the execution argument. Um, this argument, I think, is very significant. Um, section 3, the text, does say that Congress can remove the disability. So I will not disagree with Will on that point. But I think it's a mistake to say that the 14th Amendment is self-executing in all regards. Why? If you want to accuse someone of violating your 14th Amendment rights, what do you need? You don't know this. You need Section 1983, right? You need the statute. And the predecessor to Section 1983 was enacted shortly after ratification, around 1870 or so. We've always had Section 1983. So there's a distinction, right? If the government's prosecuting you, let's say for engaging in protected speech, you can always raise the First Amendment as a defense, as a shield. You don't need it in the statute to do that. Anyone can do this, right? If the government is prosecuting you, you can raise the 14th Amendment as a shield. But if you want to sue the government and seek affirmative relief, you need a statute. You need a statute. When you want to wield Section 3 as a shield, you don't need a statute. When you, when you want to wield Section 3 as a sword, you do need a statute. And indeed, after Chief Justice Chase's decision, which Wolf said was appalling, it's an appalling decision, I don't think so, but after Chase's decision, what did Congress do? They enact an enforcement action called Quo Ranto, which says that if you're in a position and you were a former rebel, a prosecutor can say, you remove this person from office. That was the mechanism by which Congress decided that statute is probably no longer in effect, I'll table that for an issue, but Trump has not been disqualified pursuant to that statute. So look. I think what the court can say is that Griffin's case maybe wasn't a perfect decision. It was very complex, and Will and I don't agree on all the particularities, but it was enough of a statement that settled the issue, right? After Chase's decision, Congress responded by enacting enforcement legislation, which I think settled the issue. And even if you don't like my argument on originalist grounds, perhaps the court progressives might want on pragmatic grounds, having 50 states apply 50 standards to decide if it was an insurrection is unworkable. So perhaps even if Chase was maybe not being a formalist, he was articulating a position that was understood by those who framed the 14th Amendment as a good idea. We can't have this, let's have a single federal process. All right, the last point that I want to sort of raise uh, 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 concerns the insurrection issue. I don't want to talk about it too much. Um, if you look at the text, there are two actual offenses. It says engaging in insurrection or rebellion, that's offense number one. Second, giving aid and comfort to the enemies thereof. Right? These are different standards. Aiding insurrection, giving aid or comfort. The word enemies is a well-known term in public international law. It means in times of war, when there's a belligerency, those are your opponents. So Germany was our enemies in World War II, for example. No one's argued that January 6th was a, was a war, so the enemies clause is not really relevant here. But what Will and Mike have done in the article is they said this phrase, aid and comfort, basically applies to the phrase insurrection. In other words, even if you don't personally go to the Capitol and put on a Viking helmet, whatever else people did, and, and put your feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk, right? Even if you don't personally do that, you've still given aid and comfort to an insurrection. You've engaged in an incohate offense. And we don't think you can convert engage into an incohate offense, right? And if you don't like that answer, you might say, oh, the take care clause, right? The president's a duty to faithfully execute the laws. This is a very hard argument. And I'll, talk, I'll close actually with James Buchanan, right? During the final year of the Buchanan presidency, he kind of just sat on his hands as the Civil War just fomented. Did, it, did his failure to stop the Civil War amount to giving aid and comfort to an insurrection? No one's argued at the time. I'm going to be very hesitant to argue that we use Section 3 in this fashion, say that the failure of a president to act to stop something is itself insurrection. And just as a point of proof, in my home state of Texas and elsewhere, people said, wait a minute. We have an invasion of the southern border, right? We have an insurrection. Joe Biden's not stopping it. By golly, he's engaging in insurrection, giving aid and comfort to our enemies in Mexico. 
Okay, I'm not accepting this argument, but you see where this goes. Black Lives Matter rallies, right? Remember those? I mean, they shut down your city, I'm sure, for some time. People occupying federal courthouses, people occupying city blocks in Seattle. And again, Will's not making the consequentialist argument, and I, I respect him for that, but the court will have to recognize if they sort of go down that road. So look, again, for Will to win, he must run the table. Everything he said has to be right. I have to be wrong with everything. See what happens. We have one more round of back and forth, and we'll take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, with respect, I do think Josh is wrong about everything. <laughs> uh, so just quickly again on the officer of the United States issue. I, I agree that Section 3 parallels the oath clause, uh, but I think the argument that the president and the vice president don't take oaths as officers of the United States under the oath clause is implausible and non-obvious and probably wrong. So Article 6 says that everybody covered by that clause has to take an oath to support the Constitution. Uh, then Article 2 describes the exact terms of the President's Oath, uh, which is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, which is a form of supporting the Constitution. It's true that for everybody else, Congress has then spelled out the exact words the oath should take, because Congress has to spell out exactly what it means. And in the case of the presidency, the Constitution spells out what it means. But it seems that the President's Oath is just an oath to support the Constitution as the others are, uh, and there are multiple ways to phrase that oath, and the Constitution takes no chances of the phrase of the President's Oath, exactly as Josh mentioned, because the President would have to take that oath of office first before you could wait around for Congress to specify it uh, for everybody else. So I don't think there's much to that argument either, um, but we can talk about the, the other two issues briefly. Do you need a statute to enforce the Constitution? <clears throat> uh, you do need, as everybody who's taken federal courts and the like will know, you do need to enforce the, con to enforce the Constitution in a, in a, uh, as a plaintiff. You do need a grant of jurisdiction. You need a court that has subject matter jurisdiction. And you do need a cause of action. You need some, some right to sue. But the plaintiffs in the Colorado case and in the other uh, state election law cases all have both those things coming from state law. They're suing in front of state courts that are courts of general or appropriate jurisdiction for election law cases. And they're suing under state statutes that say uh, voters or others, depends from state to state, have the right to sue if they think that somebody disqualified is in the ballot and they shouldn't be. That's the, the procedural posture of the Colorado case. And the Colorado Supreme Court concluded, they're the experts on Colorado law. So yes, under Colorado law, if you think somebody ineligible is on the ballot, you can sue. That's a cause of action you have to, to stop that. It is not the case, it's never been the case, that to enforce the Constitution, it has to be a federal cause of action. <clears throat> So many people do sue to enforce the Constitution under, uh, under 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. Um, many people who want to sue, like a police officer, sue under that statute, but not all. States also have their own civil rights statutes where you can sue state officers under the Constitution. Colorado, for instance, got a lot of headlines a couple years ago when they enacted a broader cause of action against Colorado police officers who violate the Constitution without the defense of qualified immunity. The, the way Colorado could do that is because states can say, if one of our officers violates the Constitution, you can, you can sue them in state court. And states even did that for federal officers, subject to a complicated regime under a statute called the Westfall Act. But it's always been the case that states can create state law causes of action to let you sue in court and litigate federal issues. That's no different from what's happening here. There's a state law cause of action, a state law grant of jurisdiction. So unless some special rules apply to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, that don't apply to other provisions of the 14th Amendment, don't apply to other parts of the Constitution, unless there are some special rules, the plaintiffs in Colorado have uh, everything they need. Now there is the question of, should we have special rules in this case because letting every state decide how to run their presidential elections will lead to chaos? That said, that is the system that our Constitution calls for. Article two of the Constitution says it's up to the legislature of each state to decide how its electors will be appointed. It does not even say they have to have elections. And historically, many states did not. Many states just said, our legislators are gonna pick these electors rather than give it to the people. I think it's good that we now let people vote for president, but as far as the Constitution is concerned, states have a lot of authority to structure those elections how they want. That's why every four years, we have to get into the minutia of state canvassing boards and state butterfly ballots and state Supreme Courts and all those things, because that's, that's where the Constitution gives the authority to run presidential elections presumably because it's too dangerous to give them to the national government, uh, which is more likely to be universally you know, controlled by one party or the other. This is the way we avoid some of the more dangerous things that could happen to our elections. 
Last point uh, on insurrection and inaction. So I don't think aid and comfort is relevant to this at all. I think the uh, more natural question here is whether Donald Trump engaged in the uh, insurrection of January 6th for the reasons we talked about. That said, I do think there is historical evidence that inaction could be a form of engaging in insurrection or rebellion. Uh, after, during, the, during the Civil War period, there was a senator from Maryland named Philip Thomas, and Congress excluded him from office, concluded that he uh, had not complied with something called the Ironclad Oath, which was a predecessor to Section 3, because of his support for the Civil War. But his support uh, took the form of two different forms of inaction. There was no claim that he'd gone to fight for the Confederacy. There was no claim that he personally had done any of that. He had been in Buchanan's cabinet during the secession winter, and the complaint was he had not done enough as Secretary of the Treasury to stop the South from seceding, and then he resigned. So one of the claims really was the Buchanan claim, that uh, his inaction as a federal officer during the crucial moments was a form of, of engagement in insurrection. His other sin, take this one personally, uh, was that his son joined the Confederate Army, and they didn't stop him. Um, and that his failure to stop his, the failure to stop his son from joining the Confederacy was a form of, of engaging in the Confederacy himself. Now this was a closely debated case. Maybe they were wrong about it, right? And they debated which piece of evidence it was, whether they were setting a dangerous precedent. But these questions of to what extent are, are couple bystanders, people who are supposed to be enforcing the laws, but instead let insurrectionists go forth, to what extent are they covered by 14.3? This is not the first time we've asked them, and in the past, we've answered them by saying, yes, sometimes you have a duty to act to save the country. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please clap. So I guess it's fitting on the last word. I'll keep it to five minutes, as we promised. I think the most fundamental question in this debate is who decides, right? Judge Sutton wrote a book by that title a couple years ago. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh asked it over and over again in the Dobbs case, even this morning, Who's listening to Loper Bright this morning? Anyone else? Who decides, right? And this is the fundamental question. Who gets to decide who becomes president? Is it going to be the judges of the Colorado Supreme Court, the judges of the US Supreme Court, the main secretary of state, the majority of Congress on January 6, 2025? Who decides? And I think even if the issues that Will and I discuss are close, right? Maybe he's right, maybe I'm right, I don't know. The better answer is put this guy on the ballot. Now, I know the other side's like, wait a minute. Trump is an existential threat to democracy. This will be the last election we ever have. If we vote Trump, we'll be marching down the streets in brown shirts in five minutes, right? I'm only slightly exaggerating. If that thought even creeps into the mind of the justices, we're in political question territory, right? We, we, are, we are through the looking glass. I think the threshold issue is who gets to decide. Now, on the election law issue, there was a guy named Barack Obama from this town. You might remember him. He ran for president in 2008. Remember, a lot of people said he was actually born in Africa. Remember that? And a lot of people sued saying, you are not a natural born citizen. And almost every court tossed those suits, saying that you know, state courts can't decide these matters federal. Not all, but most of them. Uh, Ted Cruz, who apparently was born in Calgary, as I recall, people said, you are not a natural born citizen, right? And the court said, we can't do this. There's a good argument that the state courts have no power to police the federal presidential ballot. I think there's a good argument they can't police the congressional ballot. Derek Muller has made this point. I think there's a good argument they can't police the presidential ballot as well. Unfortunately, we have Justice Gorsuch. And Justice Gorsuch wrote a case called Hassan from the Tenth Circuit. It was a two-paragraph unpublished opinion, which was not presidential. He said, of course the states have the power to please the ballot. He cited no authority. It wasn't briefed. It was dicta. I think Gorsuch is going to have a hard time coming back on that one, but we'll see. But I think Gorsuch was wrong then. If Chase was wrong, Gorsuch can be wrong also. Um, in terms of the federal, I'm sorry, the enforcement legislation, I think Chase was saying that this is not a case where the states can legislate, that you need federal legislation. I don't want to say preemption, but I'll say preemption, right? In other words, when Section 3 exists according to the Chase, the states are disabled from acting, right? This is not a case where the states can act their own enforcement legislation, you know, go above the floor. This is only for Congress to decide. Um, but all of these issues, I think, are complex. And, and I'll, I'll give Will just the, the sort of the last word and the last move cause. This is a hard case. Right? This is not a case that I think can be resolved simply. I think whatever the court does here, they should be clearly and resolve it definitively. The worst thing that could happen is for the court to take an off-ramp. To say, well, you know, the state court can't do this now, but maybe Congress can do it later. Or, ah, Section 3 only kicks in when the guy takes the oath of office, so maybe the VP can be president for a few months. That would create such chaos in the streets. So whatever the court does, do it quickly, do it cleanly, 
do it unanimously, maybe. And I think we'll be much better off for our country, but I'm also thankful to John and the Chicago chapter for hosting us. I think this event models to a T why the federal side exists, what it's best at, and how we contribute to the arena of ideas. So I thank Will, I thank John, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much. And we'll do uh, some questions and answers. I don't know, John, if you want to uh, hand around the mic, but we'll turn it I don't know. We, we, we didn't really think this through. So if you have to go, that's fine also, but we'll, we'll stick around as long as you need. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm no Donald Trump fan, but I don't, I don't see how Donald Trump could have effectively defended himself in the Colorado court. He did, it, you know, there's all sorts of precedents and res judicatas and collateral estoppels. I went to law school too. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's some overriding, there's some principle of uh, fairness and due process. He's subject to numerous federal, criminal, cases and state cases. I can't count all those cases he's subject to. How could he be expected to defend himself? How could he be expected to say, listen, members, or, you know, judge, I did this, I didn't do that. Uh, this was my thought process. He, he, he can't. He, he couldn't. Uh, he, he couldn't jeopardize okay. himself that way. So he never had. I don't care what they did in Calgary. Okay. I don't know what he did in Calgary. Okay. You people do. Okay. He did not have his day in Calgary. Okay, thank you. Will, you want to do this one? I mean, as everybody here as a lawyer knows, you know, it's true when you have, when your client is facing parallel civil and criminal proceedings, that's always a very difficult time, and they spend a lot of money on lawyers, which is one thing Donald Trump did. Uh, I guess, I, you know, but I don't to say, he had the option to present evidence in civil court if he wanted to, or not, if he thought that it was tactically more important to, to you know, preserve something for a criminal court. I don't think there's any inconsistency in his stories, though. I think, of, I think his story in the criminal cases will also be that he was not, you know, that he didn't want the insurrection of January 6th to happen. That's what he's gonna tell Jack Smith in DC. And so to say it first in Colorado might not have been a, a bad idea or particularly inconsistent. Um, but, you know, he has the choice to litigate the case how he wants to, and, Maybe he'll win on one of these new events, but it doesn't matter. Over here? Yes, sir. Professor, thank you both so much for this and for all the commentary leading up to this. Um, I, I get a little bit, uh, I hate to say, annoyed at the question or at the thought that this would lead to chaos in all 50 states and suddenly Texas will knock Biden off the ballot and that would be the end of the Republic. In the uh, 1860 presidential election, there were states that didn't even have, that Lincoln didn't get a single vote. Um, I guess, I guess to the more consequentialist point, the Supreme Court would still have a level of factual appellate review, and on the question of this importance, I would think that the Supreme Court, if it was an important enough candidate, would probably exercise a pretty searching review rather than being really deferential as they are in the ordinary case. So is it possible that if, if it were the, um, to use Professor Morris' term, the 50 state solution, that there would still be a unifying force at the front of deciding whether somebody actually engaged in insurrection if legally it applied to the presidency. Professor Blackman, do you have a Well, again, and I don't want to get into the weeds, but the trial court relied on the January 6th report. And it was said, well, the January 6th report had a couple Republicans on it. Yeah, it kind of did. Uh, was the guy from Illinois? I forgot his name already. Uh, yeah, that is, that's him, yeah. So, yeah, so, I, I mean, look, I'll make this point bluntly. Whether there's an insurrection is a question for the court of history. And this is a phrase the courts use for poor Matsu and Trump against Hawaii. It's a judgment that's based on who writes the narrative, right? It's often said that the victors write history, right? They get to decide if it's just a mere riot or an insurrection or just a, a, a tussle. And I don't know exactly what an insurrection is. And I don't say that because I haven't done research on it. I know Will has his definition and know the dictionary and all that stuff. That's all great. But January 6th is a very complicated affair. We only begin to understand it only, what, a year or two out from it. I think it's significant that no one's been indicted for insurrection, not the Proud Boys, not the Oath Keepers, no one. Not even Jack Smith is indicting one for insurrection. Maybe because it's easier to bring up the charges, we don't know. But I don't know the court wants to put its thumb on what happened January 6th right now and say this was an insurrection. And whatever definition they accept, though, will be applied in future context, which is why I think it's risky. Bill, anything you want to add to that? 
Well, I understand. Of course, there are also intermediate solutions. The court could clearly define what an insurrection is if some of us don't know the answer. The court could say, you know, here's the definition of the term for constitutional purposes, and it could answer a bunch of the questions, even if it doesn't nitpick the Colorado rules of evidence or questions like that. Um, I think that's right. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Oh, yeah, right there. Yes, in terms of uh, Professor Powell, I'd like to take a lead on this. Uh, engaging in an insurrection, uh, and you're taking the view that even if we, the facts deem that just President Trump did nothing and sat there and observed it. By the way, I was writing an opinion when that happened, and my smartphone was flicking off with messages, and it was all over by the time I put some attention to my smartphone. I mean, this is what has happened two, two and a half hours, it was uh, over with. Um, doesn't the I issue of jurisdiction come about? In other words, separation of powers. The Capitol building, isn't that under the jurisdiction of the Senate and the House? They have their own protection forces that obviously became an issue uh, later on with the, the resignation of the uh, uh, Sergeant Arms and the Chief of uh, Security, et cetera. But wouldn't you have an argument the President can't act unless the vice president or the president of the Senate said, we've got a problem and we need more executive action the mili U.S. military to come in. And don't you think that's a factor there? Uh, secondly, uh, Professor John Yu out of Berkeley, he's commented uh, publicly on this. He says there's really only one determination. You mentioned the House Committee findings. But he said there's already been only just one trial of Trump, and that was the impeachment proceedings against him, and he was acquitted. So can you rely on that on a, as a kind of a, a quote judicial finding of a court that had jurisdiction over him that he was not? So those are two questions. Either you can comment. Thank you. Uh, great. So on the first question about the jurisdiction of, over the Capitol, I think that is a complicated question. I don't think anybody has suggested that the president's inaction alone is what triggers Section Three. I think the claim is that the inaction in combination with the, the instigation of the crowd at the beginning, and I don't know if that, that matters or not. Uh, my understanding is that the jurisdictional issue is complicated, uh, and the kind of thing that if Trump had wanted to present a defense through counsel, he could have tried to argue more forcefully in the trial court and didn't, so to decide whether whether you know principles of waiver apply here, whether you expect him to, to make those defenses. He, the, the fact of the matter, though, is that the thing he did that, that stopped the uh, insurrectionists was he went on Twitter and told them to stop. <laughs> Um, and which people asked him to do earlier, and there was extensive testimony about sort of what Trump was doing to communicate to them, and, and you know why he wasn't doing it sooner and the like. I, I don't know whether we've gotten the whole set of the story. I assume we have. I assume there's a much more complicated story out there, and the trial court did its best to get the story we could. Um, and on the story we could, it doesn't seem to be the case. But you know maybe there'll be another trial in Maine or somewhere else uh, in the future. The, the impeachment thing, though, I think is a little bit ironic. So, you know, it, during the impeachment trial, the main argument that Trump's lawyers made for acquittal was that the impeachment court did not have jurisdiction over him because he was no longer president, because too much time had elapsed between the filing of the articles of impeachment and the actual trial. And as far as we can tell, counting votes, that seems to have been a decisive number of senators who said that was the reason they were going to acquit, was because the Senate no longer had jurisdiction over the impeachment. I think it's pretty elementary law that if the first tribunal concludes it doesn't have jurisdiction, then you get to another tribunal. You can't take the first tribunal's refusal to exercise jurisdiction as res judicata or something like that. So at a minimum, I think we still got questions of fresh. Let me briefly. So we haven't talked about the First Amendment, uh, but Will made a point in his paper that basically Section 3 at least partially repealed the First Amendment. So let's say that Trump's speech would otherwise be protected by the Brandenburg standard. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, Will said that we don't really talk about Brandenburg. And maybe Brandenburg was wrong as original meeting, maybe I don't want to get into that now, but does the speech itself constitute engaging incitement? And let me expand that. Do the tweets leading up to the speech count as engaging incitement? In other words, would Brandenburg even permit looking at tweets uh, a month in advance of the speech? I think it's going to be wild. Right? Remember that one? It's going to be wild. Do we even look to that? So there's some very difficult First Amendment issues here. In fact, the influence between Section 3 and the First Amendment uh, if Will goes along, then then First Amendment doesn't matter. I think it does. In fact, the trial court and Colorado Supreme Court said we look at the First Amendment, Trump's speech. So whatever happened at the Capitol, I think this was secondary to what happened at the Ellipse. 
than what happened before him. I think all those things are opportunities that you should offer. Okay, other questions? My good friend John Malcolm will hand up again. Oh, right over here. Um, I guess this one is for Professor Bob. Um, at what point does a riot become an insurrection? And if one just enters the building and is just milling around taking selfies and then leaves, is that person an insurrectionist? I mean, how do you define that mass of people? Who were the actual insurrectionists? What was the command structure? What were the weapons? And what was the plan? I mean, that to me is an insurrectionist. An insurrection. This is just a riot the guy was in. Thank you. It's a great question, uh, and as you probably know, uh, at the ratifying convention for the original Constitution, James Madison emphasizes the difference between a riot and an insurrection in talking about the militia power to suppress insurrections and how it won't reach riots. Those are sort of a good way of thinking about the, the dividing line. The 19th century case law uh, and, and discussion of this suggests that the two key differences between a riot and an insurrection are organization and purpose. Um, so a protest in which people then start like randomly destroying stuff just because it's there and they're destroying it for no particular reason might well lack both the purpose. They might not be burning down the post office because they're opposed to the mail, but just because it's there. Um, and there might not be as much organization. Uh, and the conclusion of the courts here was that there was uh, an organizational structure, at least from various groups with names you've heard in the news, um, that were present at the, as part of the, the group. Now, that seems to be a small minority of people. So there is a more interesting question there of, you know, can you have a small insurrection with hundreds and hundreds of other people who are kind of just hangers on uh, there for a different reason? Uh, and at what point does that count as engagement? Um, but I think those are the, those are the way the, um, the 19th century authorities tended to approach this, just to say, if the goal was to disrupt the electoral count, and if there was an organization to do that, those are the two crucial factors, even if they, you know, left their guns and metal uh, one more question, please. Yes, John. Thank you again, professors. Um, to the point of organization and purpose, can we talk about the senators and representatives? One of the common complaints I hear is that anyone who objected to any of the states counting participated their own way in the insurrection, if that was indeed the purpose of January 6, 21. Would a senator or representative be protected by the speech and debate clause by voting for or objecting and then in their final votes also voting against a state being certified? And I'll respond to Will. So first, I think yes, the speech and debate clause, those who don't have the tip of their tongues, uh, says that no senator or representative can be punished in any other place other than the House of Congress for their speeches and debates in the House, which means that if somehow a speech or debate in Congress violated Section 3, the only body that people could do something about that would be the House and the Senate. They could decide to exclude a senator for whatever their, their relevant uh, speech was, but that would be only, the only remedy. Um, that said, I don't think that any of the uh, things people voted for or objected to count as aid or comfort for engaging in insurrection. I think that's also pretty clear. Uh, this was something they debated a lot in the early applications of Section 3. They thought that, for instance, being a Copperhead Democrat, just like thinking for President Lincoln should stop the war and wanting him to lose, did not, uh, that they, they even said explicitly, like, being a Democrat alone is not enough to make you an insurrectionist. I mean, some of them wished it was, because it was very partisan times, but that alone was not enough. I think it's pretty clear that just the political activities we saw wouldn't qualify anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this last point on retroactivity. If Section 3, in fact, modified the First Amendment, then it may also modify the speech or debate clause. Why can't other venues consider if a member of Congress engaged in insurrection? It could also modify the House of the Judges of Elections Clause, and it says the House is the sole judge of elections. If a member of Congress engages in insurrection and Congress doesn't exclude him, why couldn't Colorado perhaps remove him from the ballot on the same lines? So retroactivity is actually a very hard issue. But my good friend John Adams is here. I started making fun of the Vice President John Adams, and the real John Adams here. And uh, thank you all for your time. John? I believe our guests will stick around if you have any more questions. So please join me in again in another round of applause for this one.